We're in the middle of a sermon series called A Becoming. And we are looking in a very slow fashion. We are walking through Romans chapter 12. In fact, we are moving so slowly that we are doing it in two separate parts. And the entire chapter, all of chapter 12, is really about how you are transformed. Because the Christian life, the life of being a follower of Jesus, is a becoming. It's one of our core values here at Family Church, is that we are transformed. That who I am now in 2018 is not who I was, or 2019, who I was in 2018. This year my plan is to learn how to read a calendar. It's something I'm really hoping will impact my life. And conversely, next year in 2020, I want to be a different person because God is changing me. And that's why we're looking specifically at Romans chapter 12. So you can turn there, and uh, we're going to be looking at verses 3, 4, and 5 today. It's funny, the last couple weeks, Pastor Craig did verse 1, Pastor Paul did verse 2. I'm doing three verses, and I think what we've learned here is that Pastor Craig and Pastor Paul, they're very lazy people, and so uh, if you see them, you can talk with them about that. You know, I was in college, and I remember I was, uh, lived at an apartment that became kind of the center, the hub of all the social happenings. Well, when that happens, even though I'm an extrovert, I needed some time to myself, and the way that I would handle that is I would get on my bike and listen to my music. And I would ride all over Medford, which was a great place to do this because it's a flat area. I remember one night I was riding on the little bike path that's on the west side of Biddle Road, headed north. And I'm just riding along, listening to music. And all of a sudden, I had a problem. The seat on my bike fell off. Now, that's a problem because that means my derriere is headed towards a, a wheel that is heading at a, at a quick rate. It could cause a revelation on my backside. You can see the problem here. Simultaneously, my handlebars turned to the left, which meant my front tire was perpendicular to the line that I was headed. That doesn't work well. What that meant is that back tire that my bottom was headed towards was now headed towards my bottom. You see how this is working. But at the exact moment when I needed to, I flipped my right leg up over the handlebar, pushed off the pedal, landed my right foot down, put my other foot down, and the bike flipped beside me. Ladies and gentlemen, I stuck the landing. Thank you. Thank you. You know what the next thing I did as I stuck the landing? You would think that that holy man up there got down on a knee and said, Jesus, I thank you. I did not. I looked around and said, did anybody see that? That was, did anyone videotape that? That was amazing. It was one of the best athletic moves I'd ever made. And in the middle of my great moment, you know what I wanted? Everyone to see it. Conversely, one day I was standing right here speaking. And uh, sometimes before a sermon, we'll play a video that'll help get, get us thinking about whatever we're going to talk about. And I had said, uh, to kind of get us set up for the sermon that we're going to do, watch this. And the video started playing, and TV was up here. And Jim, who was working in the AV department back up here, came running out of the sound booth. Now, anytime someone leaves the sound booth and runs towards the speaker, there's an immediate thought, oh, great, something's wrong with the technology. Sure enough, he came up here, and there was the problem with the technology. He said, you might want to zip your pants up. And I was like, I'm going to check behind the TV. <laughs> yeah, everything's good back here. You know what? In that moment, the last thing I wanted people to see was me. Okay? You know why? Because when we have a great moment, everyone look. And when we have a bad moment, hey, look over there. Because we don't want anyone to see. Today we're going to talk about two key components of our spiritual walk. One of them is how do we have a humble heart. And out of a humble heart, how do we have a healthy biblical community? So we're going to start in verse 3 of chapter 12. Here we go. Here's what it says. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, <coughs> do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Before you get into this core part that talks about how we view ourselves, this idea of humility, notice how it starts. This is written by a guy named Paul. Paul says specifically, for by the grace given to me. Let me give you a little background. The Apostle Paul was an amazing guy. He was the first major missionary. missionary. He was a key leader of the church. He wrote 13 books of the Bible. He seems like the kind of guy, if you're going to take advice from someone, does it sound like the Apostle Paul would be someone you'd want to be taking advice from? But he says, actually, no, not because of my background. Look at this. Here's who I really am. When he says grace, he's indicating his past. Because let me tell you about the Apostle Paul. 
His original name was Saul, and he was a horrible, horrible guy. In fact, if you define his life trajectory, it was a sinner. He actually was writing a letter to one of his close friends that he was mentoring. His name's Timothy. He wrote a letter and said, of all the people in the world, I'm the worst sinner. Here's the trajectory of Paul. He's a sinner who came into relationship with Jesus, who died and rose again for his sins. And out of that, he could have a relationship with God. You know what that's called? That's called grace. Sinners don't get to have relationships with God. That doesn't happen. But Paul, who's talking to us, says, I want you to know, before I say anything of importance about how you have a hum humble heart, I want you to know, I'm speaking to you as someone who deserves to go to hell, but has a relationship with Jesus, and that has changed everything. You see, grace is quite simply getting what you don't deserve. On the back side of your outline, there's a place for some terms. I want you to write down the definition of grace. Getting what I don't deserve. Now, I want you to put that on as a lens. Raise your hand if you're a sinner like Saul, the Apostle Paul. Great, some of you don't have your hands up. Great, you're just lying right there. Now you're a sinner. Great. Now everybody raise your hand. Thank you, those of you sinners in the back. I just saw you. I see that hand now. Very good. Grace is getting what I don't deserve. Have the lens on that says, I know I deserve hell. Just think it through those, that lens. I deserve hell. And then coming out of this, what you're going to see is how he responds. So, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you ought, every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. This entire premise is quite simply humility. And humility is seeing myself from God's perspective. I would make a suggestion to you. If you ever uh, get the opportunity, take whatever scripture you're reading. There's a translation that you're reading. You're probably not reading it in the Greek. So let's say you're, you're reading it in the, in the uh, NIV. That's the one that I was just reading from. Find a different translation. And what you'll see is how that person translated the Greek will help you understand the verse slightly differently. Because as we look at humility, which is if you flip the page back over, this is the first line on your outline. If you look at it from the New Living Translation, that part about having sober judgment, look at yourself in the spiritual mirror with sober judgment. That means a serious perspective. I'm looking at myself saying, in a serious way, what's actually true? Look what it says in the New Living. It says, be honest in your evaluation of yourself. You know what I'd love to, to have for my evaluation? Let me ignore all of the times when I get up on stage and my zipper's down. Let's just ignore those. And conversely, let's make sure everyone knows about the moments when I jumped over a bike and stuck the landing. Let's just do that, right? Because all of you have moments where it went well. You baked the pie, and it was amazing. You went out and you did the thing that you loved doing. You were playing your guitar. You were fixing a car. Whatever your, your niche is, you did it, and you nailed it, and you got it right. And there are moments. There are other moments. Usually your spouse is right there. You don't quite get it right. Are you with me? What does it look like to say, what does God say about me? In view, through the lens of grace, I'm a sinner saved by Jesus. What, who am I really? Let's have an honest evaluation of myself. You know, under that it says hum, uh, humility. I want you to write next to it. I want you to write enemy. Because I want to give you two enemies to humility. The opposite of sober judgment. One of them is arrogance. Arrogance says, look at what I did. Conversely with that, you also have insecurity. Con insecurity feels like everyone's looking at me, don't see it. And when people see me, if you are basically an insecure person, what you know is happening when you walk into the room, everyone is seeing whatever fault you have. If you don't have perfect hair, you know that's what they're looking at. If you don't have any hair, you know that's what they're looking at. Something is wrong with me. You can follow along how that goes. And the arrogant says, I'm sure they're looking at all of my good qualities. Raise your hand if you bend towards the arrogant side. Okay, very good. I would have the rest of you raise your hand for the insecure side, but I know you won't do it because someone might look at you, right? <laughs> See how that works. Here's what I thought when, I was, when we were looking at this. I thought, you know, the arrogant people, they're on one side and the insecure people on the other side. In reality, I think these two bleed together all the time. Because there are moments when I am totally arrogant. And there are moments where I go, nobody, please don't look at me. I see what's wrong with me, and I'm beating myself up, and I see everything that's, that's a problem. The arrogant person says this simple line, look at me. Interestingly enough, look what the insecure person says. Don't, don't look at me. Now, 
If you have one person saying, don't look at me, and the other person saying, look at me, what you have is the exact same heart. Do you know what the, the core of this entire uh, sentence is, both of them? One great big me. The point is me, and what will people think of? I have it. Um, this is in caps. This is for the arrogant people. Lowercase for those of you who are insecure, because I know that you... That's not me. Okay, yeah, that's more me. But the point is where you are seen, being seen or not seen is all about how people perceive you. Now, conversely, say that by the grace given me, have an honest view of myself, whether or not I stick the landing or bite it on my face, whether or not I do something amazing or I fail, what does it look like to say, what does God see in me? And when he points out something that's wrong, remember a becoming, transformation, change comes because I can't stay the way I am. You know what I, my observation is, those of you that bend towards the arrogant, you will probably, when it comes time to have a conflict, you will try and eliminate your rivals. You'll see this on a team where there's someone with talent and another young upstart comes along and he tries to squash him. Despite the fact that they are on the same team, he will try and hurt someone on the team because he's the alpha or she's the alpha. And I'm the best and I'm not going to let anyone come and take that right away from me. They will eliminate rivals. The other thing about an arrogant person is that they will do whatever they can to make sure that when they serve, that it's seen by people. So when they come to church and they, they want to make sure, hey, did you see I swept out front? Hey, did you see I vacuumed over here? Hey, did you notice what I did? Me, 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 me. Conversely, if you have someone that's struggling with an insecurity, they usually will go the other way. That they will believe that whenever there's a problem, they will believe it's about them. So if there's even a disagreement, we don't see the, the world the same way, that must mean that you don't love me or there's something wrong with me. Because the inherent belief is that something is wrong with me. Now, with sober judgment, remember this entire idea of grace, that we were saved by grace? And in saved by grace, God is doing something amazing in you, that you were chosen by God. God doesn't make mistakes, and yet that feeling comes in. Usually whenever the person that struggles with insecurity looks to serve, they usually don't want to be seen. And the sad thing is I think there are people who are unwilling to serve because it, they might look bad. Case in point, I think this comes out in two areas. One of them is in music. That someone who may have a very, very gifted voice refuses to be a part of singing, being part of the worship team, because what if they miss a note? Let me tell you, we all miss notes. But they might look bad, and it's just too scary to look bad in front of others. I was talking with my friend Josh, is the graphics guy. He makes all the graphics for Family Church. So whenever we have a new sermon series and there's a graphic for it, he's the one that creates those. And he was saying, you know, another place, not just music, that that feels is anytime you're an artist, every week that he puts up what we have here, I think he does an amazing job. And every time he puts it up there, there's a part of him that goes, oh my goodness, they're looking at what I did. They're looking. And it's tempting to try and hide and say, I'm not going to serve because don't look at me. Now, Conversely, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Look at yourself with an honest perspective. What needs to change? Let me tell you something that I see as an absolute reality for both of them. Whether or not you are arrogant or insecure, the place where they are exactly the same is when someone points out what's wrong with them. The response is defensiveness. Would you write that one down? Defensiveness. About five or six years ago, I was sitting in my office having a rough time. I uh, had sent out an email. Have you ever sent out an email and then you were kicking yourself for it? This is one of those moments. I saw someone that was making a poor decision, and I thought I would step in. And I gave good advice, and I gave it in a horrible form. Anytime you do something serious, a crucial conversation over digital form, it's not going to go well. And it didn't. In harshness, I gave great advice. And ruined a relationship. And Ed came in and he, into my office and he was just sitting, sat down and said, Are you okay? What's going on? And I told him about the story, how I had given this wonderful advice, but I did it in a bad way. And he said, Will, do you know what emotional intelligence is? You know what he's pointing out? He was, took me to the spiritual, the emotional mirror and pointed out, do you see there's something wrong and you need to make a change? Well, I'm both arrogant and insecure, so I said, shut up, you're dumb, I don't even, you're, you're emotional, and, nah. and I got defensive. 
But then you have to ask the fundamental question. Is it true? It is true. See, emotional intelligence has three components. It means you're aware of yourself, you're aware of others, and you're aware of your impact on others. And if I thought back about it, before I sent the email, I felt harsh in my, in my heart. I knew it was a bad idea. And I didn't think through the impact it would have on someone else to do it in that form, to take what may be good advice and do it in a horrible way. But here's the question. What Ed spoke into my life six years ago, did it change moving forward? Or did defensiveness win? And did I say, stop talking to me like this? Don't you realize I don't need any help from you? So, what do you do when someone points out what's wrong and they come and attack the me? Well, I'll tell you this. Without humility, without an honest perspective of ourselves, we can never have genuine community because humility is the gateway to community. You cannot have intimacy without authenticity. If, they don't let, if we don't let each other see, here's who I really am, you cannot be connected. This is the great beauty and the mystery of marriage. That when God made Adam and Eve, when he put marriage together, he said, here is husband and here is wife. And then he says they were naked and unashamed. Not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. That the husband knows everything that's wrong with the wife and loves her anyway. And the wife knows everything that the husband has done and chooses grace to love anyway. That is the beauty of intimacy, is that they're authentic. And as long as there is hiding, there is not connectivity. And if we want to be a community that is interconnected, honesty and humility and authenticity are so critical. You see, verse 3 is all about humility, and it fades right into verses 4 and 5, which is about how do we have a biblical community. Now, when I say a biblical community, I don't mean the kind of community that we have just, we live in the same town, or we're even a part of the same book club. You realize how crazy an idea of the community that we have here at Family Church is? Do you realize the differences here? We have people who are felons along with people who work for the sheriff's office. That's a beautiful irony. We have people who are dropouts and we have school teachers. We have stay-at-home moms and we have people that are in the workforce. We have drastic differences. What in the world could bring them all together? A book club cannot do that. But you see, when, when people can stand and say, I am a sinner saved by great, the grace of Jesus, and it pulls me together with other people that are not like me. You are not like me. I am not like you. And let me tell you, this group over here, you are not like them. And you, you're not like them. We are different, and yet God pulls us together. I think a great example of this, a crazy cool example of this, is what you received on your way in. I think chess is one of the great examples of this. Real quickly, this is called a rook. Raise your hand if you're a rook. A rook has some very interesting powers. A rook can go as far as it likes in a straight line. Whether straight up the board or to the right or to the left, it goes in a straight line as far as it wants. This right here is called a knight. For those of you who haven't played yet, this is called the horsey, okay? How many of you are horsies? Ah, beautiful. The horse is really cool. It's the only piece that can jump over other pieces, and it moves in an L shape. In any direction, it makes an L shape. This is obviously my favorite. It's a bishop. That's a bishop, Church. Okay, the bishop is really cool. It always stays on the same color and it moves diagonally across. Next to that is the king, and then finally, there's the queen. Raise your hand if you are a queen. I noticed that most of you, when you walked in, if there was a husband and wife and a dude got the queen, he's like, hey, honey, here you go. <laughs> Here's what you may not have known the queen is the most powerful piece on the board. The queen can go any direction as far as it likes. It is worth the most. It is the most valuable, with one exception, with the exception of the king. Raise your hand if you're a king. That's right. I didn't hand that one out. Because you serve the king of kings. But I want you to know this about chess. Chess is fascinating in that you cannot win with just one piece. Raise your hand if you're a rook. You cannot win on your own. Raise your hand if you're a bishop. It doesn't matter if you're my favorite. You can't Win on your own. You have to be in a community to win because your goal is to protect your king and capture the other king. Now, I left one out. You pitiful people. Um, <laughs> raise your hand if you are a pawn. You, I don't even know what to say to you people. 
You are the shortest. I, I am a pawn as well. You are the shortest. You are the least powerful. But you know what's wonderful about a pawn? You are also the greatest protector. In, fa in fact, you play a critical role. And when you think about family church, I want you to think about this. Some of you may look at your giftings and you make a list of how God's gifted you. And you look at it and you say, I only have these small gifts. And I look over here at the queen who can go in any direction, can go anywhere. Look at all that they have. I have nothing to offer. Some of you may not have received a pawn on your way in, but man, you feel like this when it comes to serving God's kingdom. Let me tell you something cool. Not only is the pawn the least powerful, it is the greatest protector. And something really cool about a pawn is the pawn has the greatest potential. Because a pawn, if it moves to the end of the board, if it makes it to the end, it has the potential to be transformed into a queen. It goes from the least powerful to the most powerful. But a couple things you'll need to know about it. For a pawn to be valuable, it has to be willing to play the role that it has. And sometimes a pawn doesn't move because it's there to protect the king. And I want to share with you, some of you feel like you have nothing to offer. Play the role that God called you to. But he never called you to just sit on the sidelines. He called you to be a protector or he called you to step in and help where help is needed. I'll tell you though. For a pawn to be transformed, you know what has to happen? They have to move. So let's look what Romans 12, 4 and 5 says. For just as each of us, remember four, that means in contrast, in connection with what I just said about humility. Because of that, for just as each of us is one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are all part of a connected Community, a biblical community. Write that word community on your outline. Look what it says here. For just as each of us has one body, notice it repeats it too. We have one body, but there's a whole lot of different members. I have a thumb, and I also have a shoulder. I have a knee, I also have a foot. And all of these are what make me into a full human being. In the same way, for a community, a chessboard to be there, you have to have more than one player, each of them playing the role that's critical for them. And one of the things you'll notice is there's a key here of unity, that we are one body. You know the two greatest things that bring unity? Number one is a common enemy. This is why the United States was more unified in its history, more unified between 1941 and 1945 than any other time in its history because the common enemy of Adolf Hitler unified a country against a common enemy. But there's another reason why people become unified. It's called a common mission and a common vision. And if you've ever been on a team where no one really knew where we were going, we kind of headed in every different direction. I've been at Family Church for 15 years, been on staff as a pastor for 12. And in that time, I have seen what it's like when Family Church is crystal clear on where we are going and why we exist, and we are going full speed ahead. And I have also seen us in those moments where we're kind of drifting here and then a little bit back here. And Two years ago, Pastor Ed, who's our lead pastor, made the observation, we are not clear on where we are going, and we have to bring clarity and so we re-evaluated what was our mission, what was our vision, and what was our values. And so we have a new mission statement that helps us with clarity say, why do I exist and why is it that you are here and why is it that you are here and how do we function as a team? Our mission statement is people helping people. Okay, let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what it is and then you can say it back like you knew. Okay, so it's people helping people find and follow Jesus. So we are people helping people. Exactly. You know what I've noticed? When unity happens, when we know our goal is to be someone who helps someone else in their spiritual journey and we're all in lockstep direction, we know what role we play. It's so much more clear and there's so much more unity there. Case in point, two weeks ago, this community and this county was hit with the biggest storm it's had in almost 50 years. And I was so impressed with the response of Family Church. We got an email from someone that says, what is Family Church doing to help? And I thought to myself, look for a neighborhood where someone from Family Church is, and you will find Family Church being Family Church. 
there wasn't a centralized com component. I mean, there were some aspects of that, you know, facilitating who needed help where. But for the most part, it was people living in their community. We were people helping people. Case in point, raise your hand if you shoveled someone else's driveway. Raise your hand if you charged someone else's phone. Raise your hand if you gave someone food. Raise your hand if you had people at your house because you had a wood stove and they didn't. Very good. Raise your hand if you helped someone else fix a barn. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> All over the place, people were living out the first part of the mission. People helping people. And I was so proud. I actually went across the street and shoveled someone's driveway too. It doesn't count though because I shoveled it so that I could park my car there. So that doesn't really count. <laughs> but here's an interesting thing. We were the greatest example of people helping people. And if it was just about snow being shoveled or power being turned back on or food being fed to people, and that's all it was, then we missed everything. Because if you shovel all the snow, if you charge every batter, battery, if you feed all of the people and you give everyone a warm place to stay, but people don't know Jesus, when they die, they go to hell. Which means if we are just people helping people, it's a failure. You may make the world a better place for a while. But if we are people helping people, comma, find and follow Jesus, it changes everything. So I want you to think about those people that you charged the phone for, you shoveled the, the driveway, that you were part of the life with them. I want you to think about what it would mean if that gift that you gave then moved to actual transformation where there was a conversation that led to an understanding of grace that I am a sinner and Jesus died for me and now I have a relationship with God because you know what they really need is Jesus they don't need the snow shoveled they don't need food they don't even need air to breathe they have one need one eternal need and it's a relationship with Jesus so here's what we have for you on your chair there is a card it says Jesus is risen. And on the back side, there are four spaces. Here's what we want you to do with it. These are the four, the spaces are for the four people that you were going to be praying for to invite to Easter. We want to move this from just shoveling the snow and charging the battery to find and follow Jesus. We want it to go beyond the first half of the mission statement to the real part of movement in people's spiritual journey. You see, when we're all aligned, when we're all doing what God calls us to do, the impact is significant and it's eternal. The first part of that just is one body and it brings unity because we're all on a common mission. Look at the second part, though, that really stands out to me. And these members do not all have the same function. Remember how I said you cannot win a game of chess with just one piece? You cannot do this in isolation. You cannot do this without other people. Sadly, so sadly, so many people who are a part of family church are simply a part of family church without actually being a component that moves anything. You are a show and go person. And I want to challenge that. That if what you do is simply come to a weekend and listen and go, and you are not a part of leading and moving people, being a part of serving and the active part of a body. What good is a thumb if it refuses to be a part of picking something up and moving? God has gifted you in a special way to be a part of his mission. We do not all have the same function, which means you are a part of the body that I cannot be, that she cannot be, that he cannot be. You are you and you are gifted for what God has called you to, but you have to be in the game. And I'll tell you this, how sad would it be if you came to family church, and just pick a weekend, but if you came on a weekend, you came, you listened, and you went, and you made absolutely no impact. There are people in this room right now whose hearts are breaking. Their life is falling apart, and they desperately need someone to pray over them and to hug them. But I came, I saw my friends, we chatted, and I went. We were called to so much more than that. And the gifting that you have been given is not for you to sit on it. It's for you to live it out. We do not all have the same function. Write down the word function from verse 4. And there's one more component that I see in this in that verse 5. This is honestly the part that just so encourages my soul and challenges me. Look what it says here. So in Christ, we though many form one body. It's just that repeated phrase from up above. And each member belongs to all the others. 
You know, the only way to belong to one another is if we're real with each other. See, in verse 3, he talked about humility and what it means to be open to see what's really wrong with me. Even if I see what's really wrong with me, it doesn't do any good if I hide it from everybody else. A week and a half ago, I was sitting at a coffee shop and uh, in the middle of a meeting, got into a conflict with someone. And when I say a conflict, I don't mean that there was a disagreement. I mean that I acted very, very badly, and I blew up at someone. And when I blew up at someone, it wasn't anything that that person had done to deserve it. It was me being totally inappropriate. The next Wednesday, I got to life group, and I wrestled with whether or not to share with my life group. Not just the pastor role, but the insecure person that I am. Do I say who I really am? Because who I really am is someone who sits at a coffee shop and yells at someone. I, it, it was in my heart wrestling the whole time. And then at the end, I was thinking of, have an honest view of yourself. Do I share it? Because, you know, when you act so poorly, you know, one of the things that happens, especially if there's any insecurities, you feel shame. And I'll tell you, I felt shame. I was embarrassed. I did not, did not act like a follower of Jesus. And when you're sitting with people who are part of your community, I'd rather they think of me as better than I am. But humility says, if I want to have a real relationship, is that I'm honest. And so I said, last week, this is what happened. And I would give a challenge for all of us. No matter what campus you're at, I would really like to challenge the idea, what would it look like if our life groups were really authentic? If we were real with who we are, as God is showing us what has to change over the next weeks, months, and years, what if we said, here's who I really am? It changes everything. Not only does it a catalytic move that transforms me, it also changes us. Do you know how awesome it is to feel safe? To belong? Write that on your outline. Belong. i got a couple challenges I want to give you. But first, I'm going to release to Pastor Sky and Pastor Paul, who are in Green and South Umqua. I love you guys, and we'll see you soon. Challenge number one. I want you to evaluate yourself with sober judgment. What's really true of you? First, I want you to spend a little time evaluating yourself. And then if you are courageous and you really have a, a desire to be humble, I want you to ask someone who has an insight into you. For many of you, I want you to ask your spouse, what's really true about me? You're probably going to have to prep your heart for that because that's not going to be comfortable. But let them point out what's really true. How angry am I really? How selfish am I? Would you tell me the truth? Give me an honest look. Remember that idea of sober is a serious perspective. The next thing I like to challenge you with is where do you need to move towards community? For some of you, you need to be more authentic. And it's time to be honest and say, I really struggle with this. To have some people around you that you trust and say, here's my, what my past looks like. Here's what I'm ashamed of. Think of whatever it is you don't want others to see. That's what you share to be authentic. The other thing maybe some of you are being challenged with is that you have some role to play as part of the kingdom, as part of the mission, and you are sitting on the sidelines. And it is time to get in the game. Where would that be? Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I pray for humble hearts. And I pray that you would give us an honest perspective. And then I pray that you would give us the humility and the grace to respond out of that. And I pray that it would be true that everyone in this room would be so different in 2020 because we were willing to be honest, we were willing to be humble, and we were willing to hear when truth is spoken to us. God, I also pray for the heartbeat of community that we, be, we would be an authentic group that belongs to one another, honestly and humbly telling the truth. And God, I do pray for those people who are sitting on the sidelines, putting nothing into anything, but they would be a part of something that is transformative and eternal, something beyond just a moment. Love you, Jesus, and in your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you made Family Church a part of your family worship experience. And I know that it's easy when you're watching online or when you're watching on your phone or you're watching on your TV. 
I know it's easy to, when we come to those next steps and that application part, you think, okay, I'm tuning out now. And, and honestly, that's one of the most important parts. All of this information doesn't make a difference until you begin to say, I'm going to take that in and, and think differently or pray differently or act differently. And so we really want life change to come out, not just head knowledge. So when you look at those next steps and when you talk about what can I do, I, I encourage you to take a moment and think through that and to maybe even write something down so that you will remember that. And then as you go through the devotions this week, that'll maybe help you. Um, if you download the outline, then those devotions are on there. And as you read Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, as you read through those and answer those questions, it really helps take that, that truth that we've talked about, that action that we need to take, and it kind of tamps it down in your life, hopefully, so it makes it stick. So we hope that for you, that you'll begin taking more spiritual steps. Thanks for joining us at Family Church.